essentially what, what we've been talking about here is the intergenerational transmission, right? The intergenerational transmission of psychopathogenesis. So essentially we could also be talking about the inter intergenerational transmission of severe depressive disorders, which and one of those outcomes would be therefore, uh, and the, that kind of dysregulation would be suicide. In other words, we're thinking out of this that this is not genetics alone, but this is gene environment interactions coming together in the attachment relationship. That being the case, um, in my own work, we're now looking at borderline mothers' uh, fMRI work as they are now looking at the cues of their own infants to see if they can process the cues of their own infants, either auditory, like smile, or like uh, laughing, crying, or uh, facial, like facial expression or body. And uh, we're also taking autonomic measures, and we're doing this at one month, three, six, twelve. So here you have over the first year of life looking at the differences because we're clearly thinking that that you know they're now beginning to diverge off there well that being the case on the matter of abuse and neglect this is the type d attachment the disorganized disoriented attachment there is now a growing amount of work a large amount of work now on these babies the type d attachments are 80 percent 80 80 to 85 percent suffer abuse and neglect and this is the most severe of the, of the early attachment pathologies. So we're now picking up, we're now looking for the cues, uh, the behaviors, the dyadic problems, not just the problems in the baby, but the problems in the mother-infant diets early on. And uh, studies are now going back to um, looking at borderline dyads in the second month. So we're thinking, you know, if there was one time when it was thought that personality shapes up in the third year, that's when we had Oedipal models. Well, it's pretty clear now personality is shaping up in the first year and a half. It's really shaping up in the prenatal events through the second year, etc. So everything comes forward, so to speak. And there have been rapid advances in attachment and developmental research, especially at these high-risk infants and the definitions of these high-risk infants. And let me just tell you that... Uh, a number of these studies have shown right brain deficits in these infants. Right brain It's the same kind of right brain deficits. And therefore, we're looking at at later points in time, these same kind of deficits in affect regulation. Um, the, the people who are studying depression, now I'm thinking about clinically now, and I'm looking at it from a psychiatric point of view, the people who have studied depression have been very much part of the developmental work. In fact, the impact of the mother's depression on the baby's cognitive structures, that, as you know, that work has been going back for some time. Now we're looking at the impact of the mother's depression and neglect on the later possibility of that child now developing a severe predisposition to developmental disorders. So you have the people in depression working in that. What I don't think I've seen, though, are the people in suicidology moving into this area. I don't know how much developmental work has impacted that field. Uh, I know that a number of theoreticians have speculated about early abuse and neglect, and there have been studies showing that in cases of later suicide, etc. But I would suggest here, too, this field, this specialization, needs to bring the developmental information in and needs to start directing their research in that direction too, mm -hmm. in terms of the neuroscience and also in terms of the attachment theory. Mm -hmm. The term intergenerational transmission is a common term, and you see that quite a bit, although just for the record, I've, I don't think I've ever seen it in terms of suicide uh, possibilities. Um, but, as you know, there is much work now on the impact of the mother's depression, and especially if it's long-lasting more than three months in the first year of life, etc. This would severely limit the mother's capacity to be able to attune with the baby's states, and literally, if she were in states of massive disengagement, uh, this precludes the capacity from really tracking the baby and forming the, inter the communication with the baby it would force the baby, therefore, to give up interactive regulation and to move into autoregulation. Now, ultimately, just for the record, suicide is the ultimate autoregulation um, uh, in order to keep the core of the self alive there. So what we're looking at now is even that's a dyadic model because the recent studies are now looking at how 
the baby's depression can also trigger the mother's depression. And as a matter of fact, we even know that uh, some of the triggers of her states can be because the baby is not responsive. Essentially, the mother's self-esteem is coming from her capacity to regulate the baby's autonomic nervous system, to bring that smile up and to make that cry go down, etc. But again here, if she herself were in a massively dysregulated state, so to speak, and there are, uh, there are very large hormonal changes in the woman's brain right before pregnancy and right after pregnancy. In term, so if there, that was severe, if her oxytocin levels were extremely low, if her cortisol levels were extremely high, we haven't talked about the neurochemistry of this, so, um, that this would interfere with her ab ability to be an interactive regulator and to form this attachment bond. Therefore, um, at these moments of emotional uh, intense need, especially as the baby goes into dysregulation, uh, the mother is not emotionally available, etc. And you would now have this is a, this is essentially a neglect model here. Um, abandonment is not so much her walking out for three months as at these moments, at these critical moments, not being there to be able to hold the baby emotionally, etc., in mind and in body.